Hey there, Scott here from Social Energy Presents, and we'd like to thank you for joining us. Please like, share, and subscribe to support this and other great content. We've got a real treat for you with a very special episode featuring one of the music industry's most respected lead guitarists whose indelible work has helped shape the music landscape for millions of fans worldwide for nearly five decades. Our guest today is Keith Scott, a Canadian rock musician best known for his long-term association with international music legend Brian Adams, for whom he's played lead guitar since 1981. Keith has collaborated on virtually every album and iconic song associated with Brian's extensive music catalog, spanning 14 studio albums, six live albums, six compilation albums, and countless hit singles. Keith is known for his electrifying live performances and onstage chemistry that he shares with Brian as they continue to tour internationally. The incomparable guitar legend Eddie Van Halen held Keith in high regard as one of his favorite all-time guitarists. Keith has also been credited for his songwriting skills on more than 140 songs with some of music's most influential recording artists, including Cher, Tina Turner, David Bowie, Rod Stewart, Barbara Streisand, and Elton John, just to name a few. And today, Keith joins us from his home in San Diego, California, for an intimate look at his career and to bring us up to speed on what he's working on next. So sit back, relax, and get ready, as Social Energy Now presents you with your Backstage Pass. You're at home right now? Yeah, I go. I actually leave tomorrow for another leg in America with Brian. So, yeah, where where are you heading? Like East Coast, uh, West Coast? Oh, uh, Houston. So we just started in the East Coast last trip. It was about two and a half weeks, and my last show was in Tampa. Okay. And then came home for a few days on Thursday, and out I go again. So that's nice. If you hear any peripheral noise, there <laughs> some guys working on the on the property uh, doing some landscaping and there's for some reason there's a air force um, or, or a coast guard helicopter doing training in the valley here so i'll show you kind of where we are it's this sort of long valley i'm inland uh inland about two miles so from the coast so. like what area is that it's uh just north north county san diego which is encinitas uh surface paradise whatever you want to call it so. i don't think i've ever been to san diego I've been, yeah, all over the, I've been all yeah. over California, but I don't think I've ever hit San Diego. It's about 8,900 miles south of Los Angeles. So ah. it's a long story how I got here, but uh, I've been here 15 years. I moved down in July of 208. Yeah, well, so. well, well tell me, <laughs> why, why did you move there? How did that happen? Uh, no, nothing specific, really. Um, just a bunch of things that kind of appealed to us. Uh, my kids were quite young. My My daughter was six. My son was three, going on four. And uh, I just think we started to reevaluate. I, I guess the initial idea came as the year previous, which was 2007. Um, my brother in law lived down here, uh, my partner's uh, brother. And we'd come down in the winter when the kids were small, especially in like January when it was a month of piss and rain in Vancouver, and it was like 65 degrees here in January. So um, it was, you know, something to do. We'd come down for a weekend or something and meet up and hang out in their house and go to the beach. And I think at one point we were going back to my in-law's house and um, in Rancho Penasquitas. And I, I look at this property. I said, what, where is, what is this? So it's sort of different. It's like ranch houses and property and horses and stuff. She it's Rancho Santa Fe. And I said to my partner, uh, yeah, I wonder what property costs around here. It was just a you know a notion. So <laughs> come back off a tour about three weeks later, and she's partners on the computer, and she says, I said, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm looking at houses in San Diego. I said, were you thinking of going back? Because my partner's from Missouri. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, she said, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, check it out. I'm curious myself. And then that kind of started a process of, as soon as we said that to my in-laws, they were like, oh, my gosh, we would love to have you here. Of course, yeah. So that uh, that kind of started it. And a couple of my colleagues had already lived here. Uh, Gallet used to run Brian's studio. Deb Critton had moved here with MP3. Jim Rondinelli and all that. And they moved down set up office here before it got bought out. But uh, drummer in the Hooters, uh, Dave Osikinen, lived here. There was a handful of people I knew, including Jim. 
And uh, I remember doing a casino the year before we moved uh, just north of here. And they all came out like the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, wait, we heard you might come. It's so great. Blah, blah, blah. So they kind of sold me on the idea. And we just started the process. And it took about a year. So we had to kind of dissolve a bunch of situations there up in Vancouver and then come here. And that, coincidentally, at that time, uh, Brian had decided he was going to go be a solo performer for about a year or so. So everything kind of made sense on top of the fact that we went hit a massive economic downturn at that time uh, for the world. Right. So there was a lot of things that happened coincidentally. Anyway, that's so kind of did that. Did that reflect the price of your property down there? Would the, had the prices well, dropped? Uh, yes, but not until maybe a couple of years after things uh, were a little bit low. It was harder to sell at that point, I think. For, and we were able to do, Okay, you know, but I think two years later, things were ha worth half because nobody was doing anything. And it was a unique time anyway, just to be anywhere. So, uh, <laughs> but like, the, the best part about that was the dollar was the same. It wasn't, there was no difference. It was at par. Right. That was so a, every, yeah. there was a period of time. Down. And it was total, total luck and coincidence. So everything moves south, all the, you know, all that equity thing moved without incident you know it's just perfect and now of course it's 30 percent again or whatever it's 25 i can't remember i mean just little things you know one of those things that was brought to my attention of course i didn't pay attention when i was younger but a lot of while well, you were in my childhood the canadian dollar was worth more than the american dollar at, at certain points yeah, yeah. I remember that and i think traditionally in the last 30 years it has unfortunately been the other way but yeah. um that was that rare occasion for about a year or two that the currency was virtually at par. So, you know, and I think it crept close again. At maybe the onset of COVID, my, 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 it was like maybe five or ten percent away or something. I, I can't remember. I, I rarely keep track of that stuff. But I just thought that all that stuff was interesting and coincidental at the time. So anyway, so I've been here 15 years and my kids are great. My daughter's at UBC and are going into her fourth year this fall. My son what's, just graduated. What's she taking? Uh, she's uh, international uh, relations and biz. So oh. um, her this coming year will kind of set in in stone what she'll actually embrace and she's actually considering law she's doing a pre-law thing and i don't know but she's doing great up there she has a little flat on the campus that we went for her and uh loves being back couldn't wait to go back she's done with being in california she doesn't want i mean she's fine to come back and visit but she prefers to be in canada right and uh so honestly, she's, she's in uvic like on the island here no no she's at ubc uh, on in, oh, oh ubc sorry yeah so she's she's got in. She did a local uh, year and transferred uh, right during the middle of COVID. So yeah, that turned out great. I have a lot of friends that are part of that whole system. Uh, a gal I met uh, years ago when I lived there. She's an administrator at UBC, and she kind of watched out for her. And of course, many many friends uh, uh, that actually watch over her and keep her occupied. My, my good friend Jim Cosenzo, he uh, knows the Akalinis really well, right? And uh, he has this kind of a rescue program. He takes kids off the street in East Van where he's from and gets them involved in the media and uh, film. And uh, it just, it's done an amazing job. It's been his kind of his real purpose in life and a really incredible human being and devoted to helping and making the world better. So he's always offering my daughter tickets to things like the hockey games and concerts and stuff like that. And she's, you know, we were really lucky to have these connections and it's been great. So, and she's thriving. I'm just so proud of her and my son too, who, who's done really well down here. I mean, I, I, kids, I think have really struggled the last few years emotionally. And you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff underlying with what they've had to, you know, endure the, the lockdown and, not seeing people and you know i mean your formative years that's how you develop relationships and how you learn to interact with you know you, you, both sides of, of gender wise so i think it messed guys especially young boys up a lot and we know some families that are you know a little bit struggling a little bit that way but well uh, even I mean, adults even adults i mean i've noticed with, with my wife kelly and, and stuff like there used to be interaction with people all the time and then of course when everybody went into the respective corners during the uh the the uh the, the pandemic now it's kind of hard to get everybody back out again 
Like, yeah. you know, you'll hang out with select people, not the whole gang like you used to. And it's not because you have anything against them. You've just, over the course of a couple of years, you've sort of changed your lifestyle. Yeah. You know, it's amazing yeah. how fast that can happen. I agree. And I think it, it, we're not out of this emotionally yet. I think that there's a social stigma that's developed because of it or just coincidentally or whatever. And I think we've got a long way to go to sort of let our shoulders drop a bit more. We're all kind of looking over our shoulders. What's next? If it isn't some pandemic, it's economic downfall. You know what I mean? Is yeah. Politically here, it's so magnified that way. They, they politicize everything, every choice you make, every thought process you have is you're either with us or you're against us and there's an well, we, we see it from canada from our perspective looking down there but we're, we're even sort of seeing that in canada which is i never thought would happen i mean the, from you know the last time i saw that kind of stuff happen was back in the flq days you know yeah yeah i remember i had to write a project in high school on that because it was 69 70 or something around there and yeah i had to do a social studies project based on all that and it was yeah. It was yeah. interesting time, but nothing compared to what we are doing now. I mean, considering, I mean, that was a to me an isolated, although it was big news, really big news at the time. But it was really rare for Canada, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, considering the you know a pretty benign dem democracy in the world, uh, they had actually people you know going out of their way to harm other people to declare their political agenda. So I remember that, even though it was isolated to the French speaking part, it was. Yeah. Um, it was a big deal, but nothing compared to what we got going here. This is like borderline anarchy if you if you dig it too far. I know. Well, yeah, it's just know. it's interesting, but uh, I, I don't know. Watch I think, everything you say with people. Yeah, I mean, I it's become where you know not just politically, just socially, where you have to be careful what you say. You know, what our generation inherited a lot of. You know, bias from our parents. You know, my dad was in the war in the Second World War, the end of the Second World War, and, and, and then the, all that sort of prejudice that goes along with that. And it just, you know, you kind of inherit some of it. And but you have to learn that we're in different times. And my kids just do not tolerate that stuff. They say, listen, that what you just said was not cool, you know, and I have to be, I have to be careful. And it's a, you have to reprocess. And, you know, and as you get older, some stuff just isn't funny anymore. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, what we used to laugh at, I sort of question now. Like yeah. things that I used to think, oh, it's just stereotyp stereotypical, you know, humor. It's a stereotype. Yeah. But those stereotypes can hurt people. And I yeah. never really thought about it. Yeah. And I always related back to me being Italian. Like I love a good Italian joke as good as anybody. You know, <laughs> you know but I, in fact, I, I tell probably more than anybody else. And I have native friends who tell great native jokes, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. Aboriginal. And, and, but now it's to the point of where there's been so much hurt and so much bigotry that's happened in, the, in, in that area that I think people are becoming uh, much more, I'm not going to say um, sensitive, but more acutely aware. Yeah. You yeah, know, uh, and, and, yeah, and it's the pendulum, you know, it swings, we become overly sensitive to whatever, and then it goes back, you know, it, it's just what yeah. I have witnessed in my whatever years. That, it will that, settle, it will settle in the middle eventually, yeah, it just takes it time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. And, and every time there's a new generation, those things kind of change as well. Yeah. But I was going to, I was going to ask you, you touched on a couple of things, but first of all, uh, how did you meet your wife or your partner? I, 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 are, are you married or you just live yeah. together? No, we. Uh, I say partner. The, the, I say wife is another term that uh, nobody has a problem with it. I just tend to default to that now. It's more. It's like when you call a, a woman, you don't say Mrs. or Miss. You say Ms. You know, it's right in between. So in case they're married or not, you don't want to offend anybody. So I think it's something I default to. I say partner to say that. I think it is. It is truly what that is. It's your partner. You know. Oh, of course. Well, yeah. wife do I always default the wife is something to do with the tradition of you know the the whole process of going and standing in front of the altar and declaring your vows and that's something we did officially and we did that in Las Vegas uh, 25 years ago May 1st I have to say ah, congratulations so, thank you and uh, it's a, it's one of the hardest things I ever had to do but I think <laughs> the, 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 it's like life you know you you battle with things you not battle you you, you have you know uh, wall sometimes you have to build around you know and just it, but it's it's you know it's just all part of getting older and you learn how to manage things hopefully better you know it's all you look for so yeah we started I'll tell you the story we yeah. actually physically met uh, we were touring down here and we had this band from Philadelphia 
opening up first called the Hooters. Oh, I remember. That. Yeah, I yeah. remember. Actually, I was at one of the shows in at 1987. Okay. So the Hooters backed you up at the forum. I was there that night. I, there I, I, you, I met you once again backstage in LA. Right. So they were part of it, and she was part of their entourage. Oh. So push forward a couple of years and we were looking for somebody in 1991 when we started our tour for Wake Up the Neighbors and Doug Grover, God rest his soul, uh, had knew, known Paula, uh, my wife, before and asked her if she wanted to be part of it. But uh, she, she said, I don't know about those guys. <laughs> she said, the, sing the singer's a challenge and the guitar player thinks everybody's in love with him. <laughs> really? Oh, well, something happened, and I, I don't know what it was. She was really nice, and we used to say hi to each other, but I think the gal we had at the time said, oh, he thinks that you're in love with him. I don't know why she said that. I never said that to her, but that's what she took from it. Oh. I think somebody's saying that. So, so somebody's, somebody's supposition became... Somebody's supposition became that. So she's like, well, yeah. that guy's an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I was just so I sad. never said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So we got over that, and we started hanging out in the... Uh, in the early 90s, uh, quietly, because she worked for us doing water. I didn't want to create any kind of uneasy feelings between the, the entourage, the band and everything. And I just wanted them to feel that she was just who she was, not a partner of somebody. I think that would have put a psycho psychological disadvantage for everyone. So we didn't tell anybody a couple of years later that we were seeing each other. So... Anyway, that's kind of where that manifested. And then she moved up to Vancouver and uh, and from Philly, where she lived. And then I think around the late nineties, we she got her landed status, and we said, you know what, we should just be married because we've been together enough uh, time. So we did that. Not really planning on having a family. We kind of actually agreed that we probably weren't gonna. And I was going to get older, so. And uh, anyway, we met some really great families where we lived over the North Shore. And I said, well, I wouldn't mind being a father if I could have kids like that, you know. <laughs> and they were great kids and we respected the families a lot. So we decided to try. And that Well, was... you've done a great job because I met your kids. Remember, just before the pandemic, I, uh, backstage in Victoria. Thank you. Uh, and mm -hmm. man, they're fantastic. You had a really solid family. Yeah, thank you. We've uh, we've been blessed. First of all, they uh, they were great since day one. They weren't like any issues or whatever. We just he kind of just helped steer them a little, you know. And they are who they are. And uh, we had a pretty open liberal uh, household, so uh, no agenda or anything. So we just let them be who they were, develop who they were. I guess the the marked thing is that neither of them want to participate in music, which was kind of always around. But they said, well. We love the, and they love music. My son loves all kinds of. My daughter's crazy for music; goes to concerts all the time. But they just don't want to be performing, and that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, sports was the other one. You know, they they kind of dabbled a bit in my soccer when they got it. They hated it. My son played baseball up into his freshman year of high school, and then it kind of the COVID hit and whacked, and he realized that he was probably not going to be able to compete at the level that they require around here. I mean, there was a kid out of the high school. Five years ago, he was drafted number one overall by the Philadelphia Phillies. That's the kind of competition that exists. This is like a baseball factory and football, for that matter, but uh, heavily uh, focused on athletics here. Yeah. And and California, you get to kind of work on your thing all year round because of the yeah. weather. So and they, they, I, I get it to a point. It's a really big deal here. So, but they they don't really do any kind of real competitive sports and. At which, you know, I still play hockey, for gosh sakes, you know. And uh, Well, I, you were I, always a good hockey player. I remember no, watching I'm not very you. good. Oh, I, well, I remember watching you with, with the, uh, the the musicians versus the Sea Fox thing. Okay. You, were, you, were, you looked always, you looked great on the ice. Like, you, you actually looked like a hockey player out there. Well, maybe about 40 miles per hour slower. But um, I, the guy I used to think was great was Mike Sicoli. He was a really good player. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, I just work with him on the weekend. So, okay, how's he doing? Really, really well. You know, he's still, oh. God, I think he's a scratch golfer now. God. Oh, Lord. Oh, he's, man. He's an actor. He's a singer. He's a he's a hockey player. The man well, who does it all. Well, I, I always say that Mike Sicoli is a great bunch of guys. 
<laughs> you know what? He's always been great to me. I, I just, you know, he's just been really cool to me. And uh, he was funny as hell. And, you know, I just, yeah. he was great. All of you guys, you, Jeff, him. Now, the only guy that was missing from the band, Shana, was the drummer. And I was wondering uh, what happened with him. And all. Oh, Brian. Well, Brian, yeah. we're talking about Shama right now for anybody chiming in. It's a band that I was Thank in. You. When Thank Keith you. Keith was playing the circuit up in Vancouver. We were playing the circuit, too. Well, that's where we be be became friends. But anyway, so uh, Brian Armstrong, when Shama split up, Brian Armstrong, uh, within about a year and a half, became a life insurance salesman. And boy, did he ever become a life insurance salesman. I mean, I mean, he... I mean, his house isn't a house, it's an estate. <laughs> you know, he's, he's got the tennis courts, he's got the pool, he's got the putting green, he, like, you know, the whole thing. I mean, he's done extremely well. Sadly, he lost his wife two years ago. Um, right. Now, there's there's another there's another thing. Neither neither one of them, incredibly healthy lifestyle. Everything, they watched everything they put in their mouths. Everything. No smoking, drugs, forget it. You know, mm -hmm. booze, very, 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 very slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all of a sudden, she was having backaches, and they thought it might be osteoporosis. And it was going on for quite some time. And she went in and got a checkup, and she was stage four lung cancer. Oh, sorry. And she was gone within two and a half months. It was that fast. Anyway, that, that's that's a sad story. But I was um, I was going to say no. I, I got to spin back here a bit. When um when you um do you remember when my band Cease and Desist we played a wedding up at the Vancouver Club, uh in in Vancouver and uh we had some somehow you had gotten in touch with us asking if you could sit in with us yeah and and you played with us that night now. Paula was there. Was that was that very early in your relationship? Because I'm trying uh, to. Yeah, reasonably so. I think. Yeah, she she'd been living with me, and the person that was getting married was the sister of a very good friend of ours. So um, that, I think that's where that came from. Well, you sure pro you sure proved your ear that night. Holy smokes! It's like any song we we sh threw at you, you were playing the solo to. Like crazy little thing called love. So that's not that's not an easy solo to follow. It's go through it goes through key changes and stuff, and you play it like a wizard. It was unbelievable. Well, I did have. I think I did try to do that in Bowser Moon. So um, yeah, but still, that was a, quite a few years before. Yeah. Well, I I don't know. Sometimes I I was just telling this. I think to Pat Stewart, our drummer now, because you right. um, he heard that Mickey Curry has declined to tour and he's rather stay at home, and that's his choice, and I miss him, but. Um, he were talking about, I said, you know, Pat, in the old days, if I knew I was going on on a, on a trip with Brian, I knew I could get a hold of Mick or, or Mark France or something. And I'd say, what are you guys playing this weekend? Oh, we're playing out at Gators. I said, oh, okay. You want to come sit in? Yeah, yeah. And I come by and you guys were so gracious and allowed me to sit in, you know, mistakes and all, or playing songs I'd never played before, you know, um, Bye Bye Miss American Pie, things like that, that you guys were just blowing uh, routinely. And I would come in and just try to not get in your way but the point is I could come out there and play an hour or so every night and get my hands back you know, just so I could hit the ground running when I hit the tour. And it really was such a great thing. And I, I can't thank you enough for allowing me to do oh, that. Oh, that's really kind of you. That's very sweet. I mean, the honor was totally ours, of course. We were absolutely thrilled. But, you know, it's interesting you say that because, of course, your whole point of this is to get back in shape for your touring. And I remember during the pandemic, and of course, I was, you know, I'm in my little studio here, and I was I was writing and recording and all that stuff throughout the pandemic. Um, but, of course, when you're, when you're recording and you're playing a bass part or you're playing a keyboard part or a guitar part or something, it's only for a matter of... of you know, generally, you know, you will play through the song, but it's, you know, three minutes, five minutes, maybe if it's an epic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so it, when the pandemic started opening up and I realized that Michael Sokoli and I had a bunch of uh, Simon and Garfunkel shows in the theaters that we do now. Right. And I was going, well, man, I don't know if I can sing. You know, I haven't sang for like two years, you know, right. which is I've never done that in my life. I've been singing my whole life. I never had a week off. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going, well, so. I went and I got a gig. Somebody got me a gig downtown in Victoria at this little pub. And what it was, my voice actually was okay. I slipped a few notes, you know, just from being out of shape. But my hands, oh, my God, my hands. <laughs> the first thing I did was I took my acoustic guitar and put extra light strings on it. Yeah. Oh, God, it hurt like hell. I mean, yeah. and I'm still, like, I'm still struggling with, like, thumb pains that I've never had in my life, you know. Yeah. It's weird. No, I agree, and it's if you don't uh, if you don't play a lot, and you go to try and hit it like a, an energy show, like I'd say, like we've been doing, 
you really got to it really you notice it you know not just your fingertips but your muscles and everything you start to run out of steam for things you know just then i guess that's what scared me about it was when i used to do that in the 80s and i knew that that would happen so i wanted to take care of that hopefully before i went on to the tour leg or whatever it was coming in the other thing if i couldn't see you guys i would set up my stereo whatever in the basement of the house and i'll play along to records like three or four records I kind of knew I you know, could play along to. And it would be like two or three hours of playing. Mm -hmm. And you're making mistakes, whatever. You're just kind of playing to a record. But you could play it front to back, all the songs. You knew all the changes, and you just play along. And then be within the three, four days, you felt like you had something going, and then you could go and not feel uncomfortable when you were back. So, Well, Je it. Jeff Neal, you mentioned earlier from Shama once again. Yeah, yeah. Now he's with Streetheart, but he, he's the king of discipline. Even now, like, be a day before they leave on a tour, or if they're doing even just two or three dates, whatever, he's in. It, he's got a mirror set up, and he does his complete their their complete show from beginning to end twice in front of a mirror. Wow, well, that's dedication. <laughs> he's just he's so disciplined; it's unbelievable. He's always been that way, though. Well, that lucky for him that he can look in the mirror and say, "I'm looking pretty good." I look in the mirror, and I go, "I don't want to look at that guy. Forget it." <laughs> I'll rather suffer. I'll yeah, I, suffer when I get there. <laughs> I, I, I think you're doing all right, buddy. Um, I, hope, I hope he's doing well. I haven't talked to him for a long time. Yeah, he lives in Winnipeg now. Oh, are you kidding? And yeah. as a matter of fact, I mean, I, I don't know if I should say this, but uh, he's going to get married. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're getting, him and his uh, girlfriend, Renata. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah, so he, he moved there and he... Uh, and they moved in together, and now uh, he's actually getting married. So, yeah, he's really happy. It was a really hard move for him to move out of Vancouver. But it, it just became increasingly, I think, uh, I mean, I shouldn't speak for him, but I think it was becoming increasingly, increasingly obvious that Vancouver offered less and less to him. And, right. and it was probably better for him to move to Winnipeg, which is basically where street art is based out of. And it just made more sense, you know. And please give him my regards if you do speak to oh, him. Oh, I will. I'll be talking to him tomorrow. So I certainly will. Okay. But um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> you were talking about Michael Sicoli uh, being a funny guy. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've been recently, uh, uh, Casey Boyle from your <laughs> band Bowser Moon, <laughs> um he's he's been we've been in touch quite a while and i remember his his whole thing back like when you were in bowser moon his whole, because he's such a funny guy he's incredibly right. witty and just like off the wall funny and yeah. his whole thing was to try to get you on stage where you couldn't play he was oh, always he, trying to make you laugh so hard that you couldn't even play the guitar that was his goal every night he he succeeded in every way fashionable. The other person in my life who is neck to neck with him is Jan Arden, who I've oh. been blessed oh, to be with in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, I, I'm telling you, it was like, oh my gosh, it's Casey wearing a wig. You know I mean? She was absolutely, has, and is absolutely hysterical. Uh, in the same capacity, she mimics people. She has a million jokes. I mean, I first started working with her in like 2009 or 10, and she said, "You laugh at everything I do." I said, "You are so freaking funny." I mean, I you, you and she called, she called me Giggles McSquiggles after a while <laughs> because I just laughed at everything. And everybody else in the band had heard the jokes a billion times; they didn't laugh, they didn't respond. But I'm just dying in the corner because I love that kind of stuff. And right. anyway, she was absolutely as funny as K as Casey, if not more. So I remember amazing. there was a there was a late uh, a late night. Um, radio show that i used to listen to years ago back when i had a house gig at the roxy and i listened to it coming home from work and that night it was just after Shannon had uh released the album that had insensitive on it which okay. is what a, what a song oh my god but anyway so and she was on the radio talking to this interviewer at late night and i was going oh my god this girl is absolutely freaking hilarious i mean and then i saw her on tv and she's doing a whole routine where she's imitating her mother and it was like, and it was just dead on you know, that sort of prairie midwestern accent that you know people have, and oh, just incredible. She's really, really funny, very talented. My God! And uh, I, she busted me down on stage a few nights. That we were <laughs> and I did like three records and three tours with her. Thank you to Bob Rock, who was kind enough to involve me and all that, as far as the recordings. We had a great time, and. um 
so I had three tours and everyone had these moments way off. Just ridiculous. Not only is she, I mean, you hear her sing her heartfelt songs and they're so deep and, and meaningful. And and then she turns around and tells you the, the crassiest joke you've ever heard in your life. And I just think that there is a person with massive, massive ability, you know, and sensitivity. And she's really something, you know, a, a true Canadian legend, without a doubt. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I, speaking about working on albums, I, I just uh, saw that uh, Paul Rogers has a new solo album and you play guitar on it. I did a bit, yeah. I yeah. Again, Bob invited me last September and I, and I came from the end of a trip in Ontario, Brian, and went straight to Vancouver and sat in the studio and we cranked out a bunch of bits for know, maybe half a dozen songs, I think. And it was sounding great. I mean, just the whole thing, as you know, we're all fans and we sang those songs uh, in the clubs mm -hmm. and to hear the voice coming back to the speakers and he's sitting right next to you and it's like, okay, dig in because you're so distracted by the sound of his voice and everything and the beautiful golden pipes. You know, it, it was really fun and we had a great time. It was just a couple of days of throwing some licks down and things and it was good. But I think Ray Roper did and some people in Penticton did a lot of the background. So, yeah, well, Ray Roper did a lot of the uh, tracking at his, his studio in Summerland, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Ray Roper got involved, and I believe Ray is now going to be his touring guitarist, which is a great, great thing for Ray. Because Ray is one of those, you know, ridiculous uh, unsung talent. heroes. He's always yeah. been a great guitar player, great producer, yeah. great engineer, great Same singer, way. you yeah. know. Everything. He's got the full deal, man. He's just, why? What, why wouldn't you? He's so great. you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy because that's that's a gig he deserves, you know. He's been sort of struggling for a long time and he doesn't deserve to. And, of course, uh, Rick Fedek is his drummer and Rick Fedek is like Canada's John Bonham. I mean, yeah. he's unbelievably good. And and uh, Todd Ronning, Ronning on bass, who's been with Paul for quite some time. He that's, Cliff's, that's Cliff's son, right? That's Cliff's brother. Brother, okay. Yeah. And um, and uh, he's uh, another hockey reference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> his, uh, yeah, no, and uh, Cliff even play or Cliff <laughs> Todd even plays with uh, with uh, Bad Company. So right. yeah, so he's been, he's been alongside Paul. As a matter of fact, I think the, the the single that just came out was written. I think it was written by Spud, well Rick Fedick. And, wow. and uh, Todd, and then and then Paul came in and finished it up with them. So it's they're they're pretty proud of it, you know. So so has Bad Company reunited for any reason in the last 10, 15, 20 years? I I, 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 I they they've been touring with doing these shows with with Bad Company, but um I, I and I know that Todd is playing bass with Bad Company now, but but I don't I don't know how much they actually do, you know. Okay. I know that they, they, I, I, it's hard to say. Uh, um, back a few years, uh, I'm going to say probably 2011. We when we had uh, Backman and Turner together, not just Randy Backman, but with mm -hmm. Fred came back and we called it Backman and Turner because we couldn't use the BTO thing because that was a you know yeah. litigation. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, but we toured with Paul Rogers quite a few dates, and it'd be like it'd be like one of those flip a coin: who's going to open tonight and who's going to close? We didn't neither band cared, you know. But it was fun and it was great. And what was magical about his voice was every night he would sing the song slightly different, and every night it was just as magical as the original, you know. He's just got the phrasing of like yeah. the guy is just unbelievable. It just pops out of him, you know. I know. I asked him in, in the studio, Bob ducked out, and he's just him and I. And I said, So can I ask you some questions? Yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> I said, Who did you, who did, how did you learn? Who, who did you listen to to get me to do what you do? And he said, Oh, gosh, Motown. Stacks. Sam Cook. This I was right out, you know, out of the box. No. That, those are the singers you listen yeah. to so and I, I i get it but i just want to hear him say it you know and they started telling me stories when he was a kid growing up in middlesbrough i think he's from and up north and uh he's singing you know, we were little kids we go watch these guys we went to this club we couldn't get in but we watched these limos pull up and one guy gets out and it's no reading next limo pulls up it's mitch mitchell and then jimmy hendrix and they just walked in the club and played and went that was it but he had these amazing stories about growing up and he's right in the middle of all that you know late 60s yeah. you know, thing that was going on in england so yeah quite a magical time there boy yeah. holy smokes well vancouver had that period of time in the late 80s <laughs> where no, every, even, every major band was coming up to vancouver to record 
I know you're you're from the prairies originally, right? Or no, you're from no, Sault Ste. So so Marie. Marie, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but in the late 67, 68, I was 13, 14, you know, impressionable young teenager and the whole you know, West Coast, uh, you know, the, almost like the San Francisco thing was going on in Vancouver, the Easter Beans in Stanley Park, going down there on the it was just that whole thing was right, right there. The whole social and cultural sort of movement moving forward. And I, I don't know. I mean, I feel blessed to be a part of that. I consider it a golden era for thought, not just music. You know, so I, I'm feeling like, you know, pretty lucky to be growing up in that time period. The Beatles, of course, the the guys from outer space that changed the world, even the four yeah. guys. So. The, the, uh, uh... It's interesting because I learned all of that stuff by proxy after I moved to Vancouver. I learned a lot of stuff, you know, working with Rock and Norton and John Hall and all that stuff. And so I learned I learned about the seeds of time and I heard those old records. Of course, they didn't mean as much to me because I was hearing them way like decades later. You know, yeah. at the time, it was magical to have a hometown band have songs on the radio. Yeah. Um, but and that stuff never seemed to cross the mountains, you know, or even the prairies. Like there'd be bands that were huge out of Toronto and Southern Ontario and Sault Ste. Marie played all over the radio as big as anybody, but yet they probably didn't get any further than Winnipeg. You know. So what, give me an example of what bands were huge. Um, well, there's bands called Pepper Tree, a band called Major Hoople's Boarding House. Um, there was a band called Wednesday, which was essentially a cover band, but they did release uh, the odd single and stuff that did really well on the radio. Um, let's see, James Leroy. But James Leroy did okay. He had a song called A Touch of Magic that I think it went right across Canada. Just a touch of magic in her eyes. I don't know if you remember that one, but uh, but and, sounds seventies to me. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, he, he his songs. He was a great songwriter, but his songs always had the same little trick in them, you know. But but yeah. he became he became somewhat of a mentor to me, and and uh, actually he was. Uh, he was thrilled when me and Michael, because what happened was he moved, he was from Ottawa. We moved to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, I, uh, rumor has it he met a girl in Sault Ste. Marie and re decided to retire from music for the time being and took over the uh, management of a place called the Sawmill Lounge in the Water Tower Inn in, wow. in, in Sault Ste. Marie and then would um, do the nighttime show on CKCY Radio at a right. time. So he'd get me and Mike down there and we'd, and we'd sit with him all night and he'd tell us road stories you know and of course and when jeff came back uh jeff had come back to ask michael and i to join this new band because him and brian were already on the road and so he was thrilled that we were going out and playing he's all right you're gonna you're gonna play you're gonna play a place called the sarah knights and he's telling us all about it <laughs> it was it was just great and uh sadly he he passed away but um but as a matter of fact it was interesting because shama got what our very first leg up uh, where we backed up Trooper when Trooper were at their zenith. They just released the uh, their greatest hits album, mm -hmm. and um, we were. It was the very very first day of that tour, and I was backstage and everybody was tossing a frisbee around while the crew was setting up in this arena, and so, and Ray McGuire walked in. He says, "Do you know James Leroy?" I said, "Yeah." He said, yeah. He, said he just died. I went, "What?" No. The very first day, and that's that's one thing I would have loved to have told him. Hey, man, I'm playing the big stage, you know. <laughs> you know, it's it's so it's kind of weird in a way, you know, yeah. that it happened. Now, that when did you move out of Sioux to come to the prairies? How old? Ah, uh, well. Just, <laughs> okay, whose interview is this? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say so. But no, what happened was uh, Jeff, uh, Brian Armstrong had left first because he had graduated grade twelve. He went on the road. Uh, he came back a few months later and got Jeff, who, was, who had graduated, and Jeff joined that band with Brian. Uh, Jeff came back about nine months later, I'm going to say, uh, during spring break, maybe six months later, and grabbed Michael and I and brought us to a place called Surrey and I was a restaurant in Sault Ste. Marie, which is where the musicians all gathered. And he says, look, he says, I, I'm not, I, I, I think I want to make a super band and you guys have got to be part of it. So he's, you know, and Michael and I played together. We did some bar work and stuff in Sault Ste. Marie, but I'd never played with Jeff. Well, maybe one night, uh, just a casual. I'd never played with Brian. So it was a real crapshoot. And so the whole thing was, um, so that was in March or April. And so I got a job in a music store and saved up all my money so I could pay for my plane ticket to Vancouver and have good gear. So I shipped up all my gear just before Christmas and uh, landed in Vancouver on January 2nd of 1976. Wow. Yeah, my dad let me quit high school. That's amazing. Um, I don't I don't even have my grade 10. That's like Brian. He said um, 
he quit. Uh, he was going to Sutherland or one of the high schools in the North Shore, Argyle. And uh, he went and said, I'm, I'm out of here. I want to go be a musician. He told his mom that he was 16 or 15, something like yeah. that. He joined a band called The Shock, Shocks. And his mother and he got a call from the principal saying, you, uh, your son's quitting high school. He's not even grade 11 yet. And he said, no, he wants to do it. And I support him. And he, the principal apparently turned to his mom and said, you're a bad mother. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, you know, in hindsight, you know, it, we can be judicious. But it's <laughs> just interesting. He has a similar story. That he said, you know what? This isn't going to work for me right now. So I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, then I guess I can always go and sell insurance or whatever. It's going to make your world okay again, you know? Yeah, well, my my dad saw my grades were doing nothing. The only the only classes I went to were music classes, and the rest of the classes I'd I'd skip out and go down to the music store and jam. You know? Yeah, like all mean, the musicians yeah. coming through town would stop at the music store, and I'd learn things from them. You know, don't you feel that somehow due to the era and the our time in our lives as young men or women uh, that we were kind of dragged into it in some capacity, kind of like the Pinocchio story where they all go to that. <laughs> amusement thing at the end and it, it just interesting if you stick with it if you just hang in there and, and hopefully sometime a number will call be called and you'll get a, an opportunity to do something to move forward and I, I just felt that in hindsight I look back and everything oh, Jesus first of all I was really fortunate to have worked with such great people the entire time like right from, from the end of high school I, I was in a, uh, with my friends in, in senior year of high school. One of them went went on to become, you know, his own entity, Daryl Crom. He formed Strange Advance, and this is the guy we put this little basement band together with in grade twelve and stuff. And from that, you know, I get recruited into Hammy Page uh, by a church gig that we did. And you know, those guys were really, if you know, in the guys in Hammy Page, they were serious and they were wanted to be good and they worked at, at writing songs and everything, which I thought was great. They just weren't dicking around. So they all had a real positive professional approach to it. And that those that was really a, an impact to me as a young guy. I didn't know what I was doing. I was 18, 19 years old. Ooh, I'm in clubs and you know, whatever, and easily to be distracted, I guess, but so that situation, going going for a couple of years, you see the dedication from the people around you, a little bit older than you, and then going into Zingo, which, you know, which was another thing, which I actually got to have a bigger voice in about how kind of material we could pick. And actually, uh, I think it was 1976, we went to Toronto to play the clubs out there, did a whole summer, and we saw the uh, uh, Max Webster and that song Old War had just come out and they were all dressed in white and they came out this holy crap okay that's what we should be looking at as we as players and it, that we, it wouldn't be great to have that kind of power and that's that changed the game for us that summer we started to write things together and uh, we hadn't really done that up to that point so that was another level and thankfully the people around me those guys and the core of them they were willing to try things, you know, we were trying jazz fusion things, you know, listen, let's try this because no one else is doing it and it'd be fun, you know, and we can do it, you know, kind of encouraging. And so I, I guess the point is that all my situations in those formative years were mostly positive. And I was lucky to work with people that cared, you know, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah, well, I I, I was I, I missed the Hanley Page stage of your career because that was before I moved out to Vancouver, or basically because I moved out to Vancouver in January, but we never played Vancouver till '78. Now, now in '78, we by that time we played the Body Shop, and they asked us to do to do New Year's with you guys and Zingo. We shared a New Year's stage that year. Remember. Yeah, which is really cool, and that's where I, that's where I really first met you because generally you don't really get to meet other musicians because you're usually playing yourself, you know. Um, and I so there's two bands that we met. One was Bowser Moon, mm -hmm. and uh, and the other one was Zingo. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, yeah, I remember I remember seeing. I'm pretty sure I saw you play with Zingo one night, and you guys did Baker Street. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, and it was great. And instead of instead of the the syndrome doing that, bow, you were doing it like with a slide on your guitar or something. But it was really it was really effective, and it worked really well. <laughs> yeah, I think we added a sax player at that point. That was the yeah. last year, I think. Yeah, it was the keyboard player's brother, but uh, and we were just trying because we heard all this amazing seventies pop music that we were kind of, you know. And, employed to do to perform you could just keep gigs at the clubs and we thought well there's so much sax going on in the pop world right. you know, might well, not that was a skinner brothers right 
He was, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, um, uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. The, the Skinner, talk about Dave Skinner, has mm -hmm. been posting things, of uh, recordings of Zingo. And mm -hmm. here's a song that popped up with you singing lead vocals. Oh, and I'm yeah. Like, Holy, you, you're a really good singer. The only thing I ever <laughs> saw you sing before was when you were in Bowser Moon. And I remember you were doing that um, Too Much Time on My Hands. I remember oh, yeah, no, no, no. that song, the, the yeah. stick song. But but I, it was an original song. And I'm going, wow, like you were actually a really good singer. I, it's it's amazing that you never followed that route. Yeah, I, I don't. I think I'm just lazy. <laughs> <laughs> And I've always worked with pretty good singers. Well, as soon as I got with Brian, I was all case closed. But he's always been great, supportive of me, and encouraged me to try. And I think I just always defaulted to the guitar. I felt most comfortable with that. And I mean, I still sing stuff at sound checks all the time. Nobody else knows the song, so if it's within my range, I think that's where I struggle. I'm trying to remember the lyrics, or like, and then you just foul up. But I think that's the key. If you can remember the words. You'll you'll fall into the memory uh, the melody. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really lucky with remembering lyrics. Actually, Michael Socoli and I both have that gift. We can sort of we we're, we really we're quick at memorizing songs, and once we know a song, we know it for life. You know. So yeah, we've, got, we've got quite an arsenal of songs together. If anything, you mentioning that, I mean, thank you for saying that. And I wish I'd pursued it more in some capacity. I just think it broadens you. You know, singing and playing together is the ultimate to me. If you can play piano or guitar and sing, I mean, what more do you need? You can go to your end, entertaining yourself, which is yeah. what I do. I'll try to sing a few changes, remember as I can of any song. And typically for Brian, because he's such a hit big fan, it's Beatles stuff. And if we can go through he'll just pick, start playing a chords to some, you know, early Beatles song. And I say, Oh my gosh. Okay. Sound it out in your head. And you just, you know, and there's so incredibly deep melodies uh, for me and have such impact. Uh, I think melody is the key uh, in, in any capacity. It doesn't matter whether it's classical music, jazz or anything. If you can be clever and uh, interesting with melody I think that is a real key. Yeah. And real they were they were story. certainly the kings of that. Well, you know, yeah. Lennon McCarty and Harrison. They were just incredible with that stuff. And I guess that's why I shy away from more of the shredding things today because I'd rather do something simple that people might remember, you know. And and in Brian's case, that was kind of required. You know, he he would write a lot of solo things that I would something I'd just play on the record or he would play and they were they had way more meaning in context so well look at I, the soul well bringing back the beatles look at the solo of something yeah like what a what a work of art it's a yeah. total thing to, it's a totally brand new melody yeah. that you yeah. can you can actually hum it and you never get tired of it it's a beautiful yeah. solo and it sounds like he did it in one shot that's where the way he phrased and everything yeah. you know I'm, I'm guessing but you know yeah. that in those days they wouldn't cut it. So that's good enough. You know, just, <laughs> good enough for you and amazing for everybody else in the world. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's getting fun. back to Brian. So I yeah. know that Brian was a big fan of yours before he asked you to join the band. <laughs> but it's, it's weird because it's it's odd. Somewhere around the inception of his touring band, I was I remember being at the Boo Pub, and I think. Yes, I think I was with Trauma by that time. So it was me and Mike and, and Tommy Stewart. And Remote Control was backing us up with Daryl Crom, who That's you mentioned, right. and Jim Wesley on the drums. And Brian came in and and pulled me aside. He said, what do you think of Jim Wesley as a drummer? I said, I love him. He said, yeah, because I think I just asked him to join my band. And he, I said, "Oh, that's cool." He says, "Yeah, Keith Scott's a guitar player." I went, "Really? Oh, great!" You know, it was like it was very, very beginning. It might have been. Were you, you weren't in the very first touring band, were you? Well, that was the the Daryl and the what, they, what did you call them? Remote control. Uh, remote control. So it was them. It was Ed Delinsky and Daryl and I think Paul Iverson. And Paul Brian. Iverson, yeah. And they would go do a couple sets of things, and then Brian would come and do his hour, and which I actually got to see part of. So I lived in 1980, and I was living in North Van, and I up at the top of Lonsdale with my friend Glenn, and I went down to the Whispers, which was a 15 minute walk from where I lived, and there was uh, Brian Adams playing that night. Well, okay, and I I knew him, but I didn't know him really well. It was obviously prior to him contacting me about working, and and he was just by himself, and he was playing one of those big Yamaha CPU threes, whatever you call them, 
Yeah. And singing songs, uh, no one makes it right, all this stuff. And uh, he's like kind of like Elton or something, which I thought was interesting. That's how he was kind of delivering it. And uh, I, thought, and he, I think he played one or two songs at the end or something. But that was my first introduction to him, seeing him actually as Brian. So. And so how did it come about, you, you joining his band? Because, I mean, you've been his right-hand man, like, since since that day, basically, right? Um, well, again, like, reiterating what you just said about Jim, he, uh, I think I was I was going into a, a, a liquor store, I think, in West Van. I was living out that way then. I, I was with Bowser Moon then. So I went in, I, who comes walking out? It's Brian. I said, oh, man, how you doing? And uh, we stayed in touch. I, I go back. Uh, a couple of years. I had met him in Toronto by a mutual friend. And he was 17. Was he was 20. in Sweeney Todd? He was in Sweeney Todd. Right. And I said, how's it going? He goes, oh, it's okay. You know, I, it's just what it is. He's, I'm actually out here shopping my demos. Jim and I, uh, Jim Allen and I write all these songs. We're trying to get it signed, you know. So, okay. So it was kind of a vehicle for that. And then he, and, you know, we had lunch and I, I said goodbye. And then, but he always stayed in touch with me and called me at like six months. He said, Hey man, I'm doing a session at Pinewood. Uh, come down and uh, we'll go for pizza. And like he was just really like, I guess networking in a way before that word existed as far as I know. So anyway, he would stay in touch. And then I was playing with the moon down in uh, a place on Marine drive uh, for Fraser arms. For Fraser arms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the room downstairs? The where, where, Reservation Cabaret or something? Is that what they called it? Oh, uh, the fr Frams? No, no, free, Freezer Arms. Yeah, down downstairs. Yeah, Frams. It was called Frams. Frams. Yeah. Frams. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we down, and he showed up with a little bit of a posse and he said, okay, uh, I know I haven't talked to you in a while, but I made this record in New York with these great musicians with Bob Clear Mountain, blah, blah, blah. I need to put a band together. Would you be interested in trying something? I said, well, okay. He goes, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot a record over to you. And I said, okay. So we stayed in touch and I listened to the record and it Okay, yeah, I guess I could probably try this, and, and I, I didn't really consider because I knew I was pretty entrenched with Casey and that, and we had a great relationship, and we have a lot of fun together playing the clubs. But I think we both had a sense that it was only going to go so far unless one of us picked up the torch and started putting songs out together. If you don't do that, you're you're going to have to reconfigure. So, um, and I had a talk with Casey. I said, "Listen, this has happened." And he goes. So I'm so glad you talked to me because I'm getting hammered by the agency to be an agent because they think I could do great and I can make way more money. And he says, I'm kind of thinking maybe my singing thing is kind of coming to an end and all that. So I think it was coincidental. We both agree. And I said, he said, well, just, you know, give it a try. And we always got the moon. We can always do it anytime you want. So we started looking for people and it was Brian and I, we auditioned bass players, uh, uh, drummers. And finally Jim became part of it. Uh, a guy, uh, was his name? Dave oh, Reimer. Dave, was, Dave Reimer was, played bass for a bit, yeah. The first guy. Uh, and John Hanna came over from Bowser Moon. Right. So we had a core of people that we go to. Jody, this, uh, our sound man, of course, was with Bowser Moon. He's still here with me. <laughs> 42 well, I, I, I heard later. that Jody retired. He just did. But uh, our guy, we, Brian hired a guy from Germany who's uh, uh, tied into this really big band called Totenhosen, which is like this heavy band. So, um, he had to go do some commitments for that. This so Jody came back for this last leg, which was oh, great. Cool. Yes, we go back a long way, and I, you know, I couldn't stand not having him around. So yeah, so he's he's been filling in. Anyway, so this core of people came from Bowser Moon and other places, and that's kind of where it started. We rehearsed that summer of '81, and uh, put a little club show together. Did it in September. Did some dropped in on some people. Uh, played at Whispers, blah blah, blah at Gators. And then we started, our first ticketed show was at the Commodore, October 2nd, 1981. And we did every club from Vancouver on east into uh, Toronto area. And uh, yeah, it was kind of humble beginnings. So you walk into a club in Thunder Bay and there's eight people. And it's like a kiss chance down the lonely night. Nobody knows what you're doing. But, you know, I have to hand it to Brian because he was on the phone. I room with him. And he was on the phone every day in the next city, talking to the program directors and the station managers, saying, "How come you're not playing my record, man? It's going, it's moving up." It's not, you know, he was really a great salesperson for his own work, and yeah, he never stopped. He never gave up. He I heard, a, I heard a story about Brian. I, maybe you can confirm this or not. Um, that he, when he was in Sweeney Todd, he networked so well that he would meet all any record person, any any record store person, yeah. any record executive person, any A and R guy, whatever, and he'd talk to them and find out things like their kids, how old, 
wife, mm-hmm. all that stuff, and write it all down. Yeah. And and kept a, a diary of that. So when he was pushing his own records, he'd phone up, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's Jane doing? Oh, great. And how's little Billy? He must mm-hmm. be about eight years old now, huh? <laughs> that, like, uh, uh, that wouldn't surprise me. That seems like something he would do, right? Yeah. No, he's a memory like a steel trap. He remembers what I did in, like, 1983 backstage in, like, you know, Dusseldorf. I don't know what <laughs> shoes I was wearing. I, I can't remember. But, you know, he's great. He's He's got a terrific memory that way. And, uh, you know, but that, that's kind of the humble beginnings of it. And it just, you know, we just kept working at it. And him and Jim, you know, right place, right time. Uh, I just saw Jim in New York. We, we played uh, there a few weeks back at the Nascar Garden. And he came and he's kind of retired now. But uh, yeah, no, I know. I, I, last time I was with Jim, actually, was in London, in England. Michael and I went over and did our, our Billy and Elton show. <laughs> we, we have lots of shows we do together. Awesome. <laughs> and, yeah. So we went, and it's funny because a friend of mine uh, who lives in England, he says, it's weird you're playing here. He says, I just saw Elton play here himself last year. <laughs> And we're playing we we're playing a big corporate party right so it was quite funny and uh but anyway so G- we went out for dinner with jim and it was great you know i mean i, I just love him I, I talk to him a fair amount we, we we exchange things all the time and we're still talking about beatles after all these years hey did you hear this you hear this little lick on this record yeah well i think that's about you, know? <laughs> you know i mean we send stems of songs back and forth to each other all the time he's just great i know and, yeah, uh, what a really craftsman good. man jeez yeah. that guy's talented and uh yeah, just absolutely astounding. Again, one of those people that you're just so blessed to have, you know, part of your life and not just musically, but personally, you know, in every way. He's always been such a supporter and, you know, I'm just really grateful for that. You know, lucky. Just no. always with him. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, it's, it is. And, and, and you know, you, you talked about uh, being so grateful on playing some of these albums, but I, I remember, I think you came to see us one night in Richmond or something. And I think you had just done some sessions with Carly Simon, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the people you've worked with, I mean, we, we like, I mean, you know, uh, Tina Turner, who we just yeah. lost. Uh, yeah, like, all, like all, you've, you've been around some really cool people in your life and played some really huge, like you're the Zenith, the biggest of the big, you know? <laughs> well, I, I think, again, it's the associations, um, you know, with Brian and Bob Clement and, you know, Bob Rock, of course, in the last 20, 30 years has just been so great to me. And come on, come on, you got to come and do this. You know, it's okay. And I'm, I will never say no to that guy or any of them because not just because you feel like you owe, but it's the experience is always so positive and we have a great time. We catch up and, you know, talk about things we like and don't like or whatever, you know, and we have families and it's just everything about it's your community, your real community, your life community. So yeah. again, being part of all that stuff in the eighties, uh, Tina Turner, like my wife worked for Tina Turner and Elton actually that, in the same capacity for a couple quite a bit so the news what did she came, what did she do with them was wardrobe yeah so that's how we met um but she worked for tina in the same capacity and she was tour managing the band for a little bit before it became a little bit too too much she said i don't think i'm done that was like late 90s so and then uh, we got married and then we had kids so that that was wow a, yeah, incredible so. eh? and how, how old did you see your kids were again uh, my daughter's 21 and my son's 18. So. Okay. So, so I would have met them when they were like probably 18 and, you know, yeah, 14, like, something like that. 14, yeah, so. I mean, that'd be five years ago. So yeah, about 16. Well, it was probably, t- I'm thinking it was 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah 2019. Yeah, four yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So, but I think. I, I mean, I for one thing, it's great to talk to you because we're I know. old friends and I've always had great rapport. You know, I, I, it's funny because people say, you know what, Scott? I said, yeah, I used to babysit my daughter. <laughs> 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 I mean, there was a period of time we actually did. I mean, I, I mean, because you, you were you were dating somebody who was friends with my wife, and yeah, yeah. I just remember uh, you had kids much earlier than I did. So you obviously did the smart thing because that's, I think in hindsight, that's probably what you should do, do it earlier. Well, you know, I, here's the flip side of that. It, it, there's a book called, and I, I'm not, I'm in no way religious, but I did read this book that I thought was interesting. It's a trilogy called Conversations with God. Mm-hmm. And in the God character in book number three says, children were never meant to be raised by their parents. They were right. meant to be raised by the grandparents. The parents are still trying to figure it out. Right. And, and you know, really, I, I shouldn't have had kids well carol and i adopted i mean i adopted uh carolyn came into my life when i was 18 she was already two 
Um, and and I so I adopted her by the time I was twenty. Yeah, Carmen Carmen was born when I was twenty years old, and two months later, Carolyn's legal adoption came through. So essentially, I got two kids within two months because mm-hmm. um, she st- Carolyn started kindergarten as Carolyn Houston. And after Christmas, she became Carolyn Della Vicenza. So, okay. uh, but yeah, but uh, it, I, I, there's so many things I would do different now, you know, in hindsight, you know, I mean, everybody says that, but that's, what I mean, a grandparent has a perspective of things. An older person has a perspective of things. You're not still struggling and, and freaking out about every little bill and, you know. Sure. sure. And, and I think here's, here's a context for you. Uh, when my kids were young, they entered the public school down here in San Diego. <laughs> And I remember walking, I think I loved was walking my kids in and out of school. I just thought that was the greatest. And I, I never, it never happened to me. My mom kicked me out the door and said, make, go, go to school. I'll kill you. You know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I walked my kids in. I can see other parents who are like 20, 30 years younger than me. He goes, oh, isn't that sweet? Their grandpa's walking. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's context for you, huh? not to do it too late, you know, so. Well, I'm well. That's the same thing. I mean, on the other, on the flip side of that, I remember going to uh, Safeway with Carolyn when she was about. Mm, I'm going to say she was about 17 at the time. We went to Safeway, and and the the girl behind the counter thought we were a couple. <laughs> <laughs> and Carolyn thought that was the best thing on earth. She laughed her head off about that for the longest time. Oh you know? gosh. Anyway, Where that's it. It, it, we're we're lucky. I, I, I'm just so lucky. The kids are great. We, they really are. They're polite and sweet and up and upbeat, and they're really really nice. And so is Paula. I mean, Paula was like so great to me because I, I, you know, uh, after the show was over, you and I were in touch. And after the show was over, I was going, okay, I'm not going to bother him. And I was walking out, and she came and grabbed me. Right. And she said, "Oh, she says Keith wants to say hi to you." So mm-hmm. th- that's why I went backstage. I was going to leave you alone because I figured, ah, he doesn't need to talk to me. <laughs> no, I to say hi, and I wanted to yeah. meet your, your partner and all that. Um, now, you're still in Victoria, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No regrets yeah. here, boy. I'm so happy. Well, we're going to be up in September if you're interested, if you're around. Make sure if if, you, if we are and you're around, I'd love to say hi and have a coffee if you want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to have over, if you got time to come over to the house. You probably wouldn't. I'm, I'm sure with Victoria, the way it's situated, you probably arrive and leave almost right away. So I Probably. I think it's the first date on that leg. So I would come the day before. Oh, and cool. Yeah. So if the, yeah, we'll okay, well, maybe that that's what we could do. With it. It'll it'll still be nice. So you can come out, have a coffee on the back deck, and look over the lake. I got a beautiful little spot here. Okay, beautiful. Well yeah. done. But anyway, so you're touring the states coming up. Uh, mm-hmm. You said you're go- you on the east side. You said you were saying no. It's through Texas. And oh, Texas. Sorry, I'm not in yeah. the middle of Minnesota and stuff. You know. And then you're so then are are you doing Western Can- Eastern Canada and Western Canada or just the odd jaunt up here? So we hit the east. We start in Baltimore, New York, Boston, Buffalo, Syracuse. Uh, went down through Florida, and then we'll go through Texas up through the Midwest, and then the last leg is like through here up to Portland, LA, Portland, Seattle, and then a couple of privates. That takes me to mid August, and then September is up your area. A couple of private things what did you say the 22nd of september yeah i haven't looked yet i i think it's earlier than that um so that leg the western leg is about 10 days and then uh october is open right now but they wanted to do maybe more joan dates inside joan jet in here and then oh, cool. um, and then november is uh, middle east and uh, south africa which we've been to several times in the last 30 years and uh, and then before Christmas is Eastern Europe, so it winds up in Turkey, and then I'd be home. How how often are you able to enjoy the actual places you're playing? Uh, we we tend to, you know, we have over the years, and we've always made it a point of if we are a tourist and we're there for the first time, we try to see what's important. So uh, we've done great things. Like Brian's really good about stuff like that. It was I have to remember this one thing. I've told this before. I think we were playing in Dubai in the Middle East in the Emirates. And our last show was in Amman, Jordan, which I had never been to before. And I started looking and tried, holy crap, that's really close to that famous built into the rock place from oh, many years ago, 6,000 years ago, a place called Petra. Mm-hmm. And it's been featured in films and all, it's, you know, everything, National Geographic. I thought it would be great. So I started looking into it and it was, it was like two or three hours drive south of Amman. 
And I went to Brian, we're getting on the plane. I said, so what are you doing after this last show? He said, oh, I got photography in London. I said, okay. I said, he goes, why, why? And I said, oh, well, I was in Petra is like south of Amman. I'm thinking, I talked to my wife and I said, I'd like to stay an extra day to see that, take a bus down, see it, and then come home the, and stay an extra, and come home the following day. And she said, no problem. I said, I was wondering if maybe you do that. And he said, no, I, I can't. And he could see his wheels going. So I go back, sit in my seat, about 20 minutes ago, comes back, hey, I got to figure it out. And we land, there's a helicopter picking us up. We're going straight to the Petra. It takes us 20 minutes. We go take some pictures, come back to the show, and we go home. It's like, I need to take care of everything. Well, like I, the I, royal family of Jordan picked us up in their military helicopter. But he, because he wanted to get it done, you know, and I thought that was really amazing. So I'm good for him. But you know, that's uh, you, you mentioned that about Brian. I mean, Brian, it's like how many people can pick up photography and be he, he shot the queen for God's sakes. No, you know, I, I mean, it, I, so he became incredibly good at that as well. Yeah, he just really wanted to do great and he studied it hard. And uh, he's just a fan, he is passionate, and he it's like became friends with her Ritz's assistant and learned all his tricks about lighting and uh, aperture and. Just studied it, studied it, kept trying things and brought his own style into it. And, you know, he just loves it. So, wow. What a guy. Yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. And I Thank can't you. believe it. It's been two freaking hours. Yeah, but... Sorry, man. No, 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 no. Are you kidding? We could go forever, but there's only so much room on my hard drive. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is incredible. I can't. Oh, man. This is, uh, for one thing, it's just great to touch base with you. But um, it, uh, We'll, we'll stay in touch. We got each other's information, so let's uh, let's see if we can hit each other up somewhere around your date in Victoria. Hopefully, I'm not out with Backman. I might be out on a Backman tour at that time, but uh, we'll we'll see. Well, thank it, you so it'll much. Be great. Thank you for inviting me. And I, I I don't get to sort of explain a lot of what my history. It's just not enough time. You know, I do podcasts and once in a blue moon, and they want to know real basic things. You only got time to do so much anyway it's nice to see somebody that i was you know part of the club thing and everything that has a history with me of 40 50 years and we have so much in common and so much to share so i, I appreciate you doing that and it's important to get it out and let people know before it goes away i think so. well that's the thing it becomes almost like a living uh you know legacy you know yeah. um that's what that's why I sort of like seeing pictures of you as a as a child and hearing about your parents and hearing about your schooling and all that sort of stuff because that all became who you were now you know mm -hmm. yeah and who you are now so a, psych a psychologist would probably give you a pretty detailed rundown about why and what drives you and you know there's a lot of references to that especially at this point in my life where yeah if you look back on your history it makes sense to some degree because of your upbringing or whatever so. there's one thing i didn't ask you is that you started playing guitar around 12 13 you said right mm -hmm. which is similar to me uh now did you continue playing sports were you were, okay tell me about your sports did you play sports through school leading up to that time and did you continue after you started playing guitar yeah, I mean, I played, you know, like most kids in a community level. You know, it wasn't serious like the way they have here. My son's baseball and they're doing you know, professional camps and they're going on these paid trips to, you know, it's like a cost of fortune, you know, and it's so intense and they're ex-pro, I'm getting on and on and on. And hockey is no different up there. You got to know the right people and get in the right programs. That's, That's why you see so many kids that are sons of players because they know what it took to get to that level. And you have to have the right direction, you know, as a young person. So, which is why you, you know, don't see. That's why you don't see so many ethnic people playing in the hockey. In hockey, it's not their inability. It's the fact that there just wasn't the money. The amount of money it takes to get a kid through hockey is ridiculous. I know, and never mind the equipment. Just the actual the training at what it costs. So anyway, I, I think it's there's some of that, you know. I, but my sport thing was always a real casual community level. I played high, uh, not community football. I was 15, 16. And a guy went to school with, uh, he went on to become a college player. He played for SFU and was drafted and played in the CFL. It was and for three, four years. And, and I thought that was pretty cool that a guy that I grew up with in my neighborhood went on to be a professional football player. Right. So there was a chance that you may have made it your profession, but pretty slim. You have to be, have all the right pieces in place physically and mentally and all that and, and everything else. So, but no, my, all my sports was community level. I played a little bit of hockey until I was 13 or so. And then as soon as music came in, a lot of the sports kind of went on the back burner. 
and uh, I started getting to music, music more. And that was until my early mid twenties, and I started trying to skate again. And I met up with people and go play at four rinks or eight rinks or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and four then, rinks was where everybody went. Yeah, because you yeah. could get ice time after the clubs closed. Yeah, and then if you played at ten o'clock at night on a Thursday, it would be fifteen dollars, and you go play shinny with a bunch of guys, and that's kind of what I did right up until the point where I left, and and I still do that here now. Uh, I better explain what I meant about that ethnic thing, and uh, because it may, it may be misinterpreted. Uh, what I was talking more about is having means and and the privilege that a person with money. Because it, it takes a lot of money to put a person through things like that. And a lot of ethnic families just didn't have that kind of money. That's what I meant by it. Just so people don't misconstrue what well, I said. And I understand. It's like people that have recently emigrated and they're, you know, for whatever reason, and it's more about just surviving the system and getting started. So uh, believe me, yeah. uh, professional yeah. hockey is probably way far down the line. So yeah, absolutely. Really so anyway, that that's kind of the sports. I, I kind of gave it up and then kind of got back into it. And so I was playing soccer. I was playing I played touch football in this lower mainland league in uh, around 80, early 80s with my brother. And uh, I think I helped trash my knees a little bit. But I, it was, I, I always enjoyed physical activity. And, you know, and I look at pictures of myself. Like I should have been a gym teacher or something, you know. But uh, Which, which brings us to this thing. You guys were playing at the paddock in Regina. We were playing at the Sahara Night with Shama. You guys were there with Bowser Moon. And we had a baseball tournament. Remember that? Oh, oh my gosh! And you, you bastards! You brought in a ringer for a pitcher. The guy, the guy actually played league baseball. <laughs> oh but I think we won by one run because <laughs> we we recruited whatever people were coming out to the club, which were mostly drunks. <laughs> that oh was hilarious. I did play in a mixed softball league with Bruce Allen, and he had a team of Dave Chesney at Columbia. Oh and, wow! And uh, it was called the Warriors, and I came in. That's how I trashed my knee the first time, and uh, shagging a fly. And, and we, it was fun. It was people in, in the record business, and, and Bruce, and a couple other people, and it, it was okay. But I trashed my knee, and then I went back the next year, and then I was. I so, do so it. who's who's your teams? Who do you go for? Okay, like, so don't hate baseball, me. football, hockey. I'll start with hockey because that's what I grew up with, and uh, of course, everybody when you're that young. It's Toronto or Montreal. You know, choose one or the other. But as I got older, I chose Boston. And I, I was a Boston know. fan too. Well, that that was during the uh, Bobby Orr, Phil Esposito, yeah. of course, because he's from Sault Ste. Marie. That's right. And so we were the same thing. Bobby Orr, oh my gosh, the second coming. So yeah. you hit your, your, your wagon to that train. And, and that, I've been a Bruins fan ever since. And 2011 was like science fiction because I was overseas watching the final and the last game. And <laughs> I was with a bunch of people <laughs> I was the only Bruins fan in the entourage and they wanted to kill me. So <laughs> I felt bad for the fans because they waited so long and they, they had a great team that year and it just, just didn't work out. You know, it just, it's tragic. It was much like it did for the Bruins this year. They had all the pieces mm -hmm. they get pushed out by the Panthers. So, well, you know, the, the playoffs yeah. more and more and is, is all about the goalie. Yeah. You, know, you see that when you look at the shots on net and who wins, it's generally always the shots on that favors the losing team. Yeah. Yes, so, almost always. So I don't really follow football so much anymore, but baseball um, uh, has always been the Yankees since I was a kid because of Mickey Mantle. So oh. it's kind of, that's about the extent of it for me. And, you know, I don't really go farther than that. So, yeah, cool. Well, great talking to you, brother. And you as well. And yeah, you know, all the best to you and your family. Yeah, well, hopefully we can connect in September. I'd love to have you over to the house. I, I, yeah. Do you know if your family's going to be with you? Uh, possibly. My, my daughter, for sure, because she's up at UBC, and she's about to come. And we'll have, we promised to have tea at the Empress. So. Oh, oh, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you got to experience that. <laughs> I know, we love that. We love that. So um, do that, and but possibly Paula, but I don't know. My son will be in college, so. Yeah, here. So that'll be it. But I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing you regardless. Yeah, we'll we'll figure it out somehow. Thanks a lot, Keith. Thank you for having Take me. Take care, buddy. brother. Have a great day. See you soon. All right. Cheers, ciao. man. Bye bye.